The story of Fenris. Tyr was generally spoken of and represented as one-armed, just as Odin was called one-eyed. Various explanations are offered by different authorities. Some claim that it was because he could give the victory only to one side, others because a sword has but one blade. However this may be, the ancients preferred to account for the fact in the following way. Loki married secretly at Jotunheim, the hideous giantess Angerboda, anguish boding, who bore him three monstrous children. The wolf Fenris, Hel, the party-colored goddess of death, and Jormungandr, a terrible serpent. He kept the existence of these monsters secret as long as he could, but they speedily grew so large that they could no longer remain confined in the cave where they had come to light. Odin from his throne, Lidskjalf, soon became aware of their existence, and also of the disquieting rapidity with which they increased in size. Fearful lest the monsters, when they had gained further strength, should invade Asgard and destroy the gods, Allfather determined to get rid of them, and striding off to Jotunheim, he flung Hel into the depths of Niflheim, telling her she could reign over the nine dismal worlds of the dead. He then cast Jormungandr into the sea, where he attained such immense proportions that at last he encircled the earth and could bite his own tail. Into mid-ocean's dark depths hurled, grown with each day to giant size, the serpent soon enclosed the world with tail and mouth in circle wise, held harmless still by Odin's will. None too well pleased that the serpent should attain such fearful dimensions in his new element, Odin resolved to lead Fenris to Asgard, where he hoped, by kindly treatment, to make him gentle and tractable. But the gods one day and all shrank in dismay when they saw the wolf, and none dared approach to give him food except Tyr, whom nothing daunted. Seeing that Fenris daily increased in size, strength, veracity, and fierceness, the gods assembled in council to deliberate how they best might dispose of him. They unanimously decided that as it would desecrate their peace steads to slay him, they would bind him fast so that he could work them no harm. With that purpose in view, they obtained a strong chain named Lighting, and then playfully proposed to Fenris to bind this about him as a test of his vaunted strength. Confident in his ability to release himself, Fenris patiently allowed them to bind him, and when all stood aside, with a mighty effort he stretched himself and easily burst the chain asunder. Concealing their chagrin, the gods were loud in praise of his strength, but they next produced a much stronger fetter, Droma, which after some persuasion, the wolf allowed them to fasten around him as before. Again, a short, sharp struggle sufficed to burst this bond, and it is proverbial in the north to use the figurative expression to get loose out of their lading and to dash out of Droma whenever great difficulties have to be surmounted. Twice did the Acer strive to bind, twice did they fetters powerless find, iron or brass of no avail, not save through magic could they prevail. The gods perceiving now that ordinary bonds, however strong, would never prevail against the Fenris wolf's great strength, bade Skirnir, Freya's servant, go down to Svartalfheim and bid the dwarfs fashion a bond which nothing could sever. By magic arts the dark elves manufactured a slender silken rope from such impalpable materials as the sound of a cat's footsteps, a woman's beard, the roots of a mountain, the longings of the bear, the voice of fishes, and the spittle of birds, and when it was fashioned they gave it to Skirnir, assuring him 
that no strength would avail to break it, and that no more of it was strained than stronger it would become. Gleipnir at last by dark elves cast, in Svartalfheim, with strong spells wrought, to Odin was by Skirner brought, as soft as silk, as light as air, yet still of magic power most rare. Armed with this bond called Glipnir, the gods went with Fenris to the island of Lingvi in the middle of Lake Amsvardnir, and again proposed to test his strength. But although Fenris had grown still stronger, he trusted the bond which looked so light. He therefore refused to allow himself to be bound, unless one of the Aesir would conceive to put his hand in his mouth and leave it there as a pledge of good faith that no magic arts were to be used against him. The gods heard the decision with dismay, and all drew back except Tyr, who, seeing that the others would not venture to comply with this condition, boldly stepped forward and thrust his hand between the monster's jaws. The gods now fastened Glipnir securely around Fenris's neck and paws, and when they saw that his utmost efforts to free himself were fruitless, they shouted and laughed with glee. Tyr, however, could not share the joy, for the wolf, finding himself captive, bit off the god's hand at the wrist, which since then has been known as the wolf's joint. Loki, be silent, Tyr. Thou could never settle a strife twixt two, of thy right hand also I must mention make, which Fenris from thee take. Tyr, I of a hand am wanting, but thou of honest fame, sad is the lack of either, nor is the wolf at ease, he in bonds must abide until the god's destruction. Deprived of his right hand, Tyr was now forced to use the maimed arm for his shield, and to wield his sword with his left hand, but such was his dexterity that he slew his enemies as before. The gods, in spite of the wolf's struggles, drew the end of the fetter Gelgia through the rock Yol and fastened it to the boulder Thviti, which was sunk deep in the ground. Opening wide his fearful jaws, Fenris uttered such terrible howls that the gods, to silence him, thrust a sword into his mouth, the hilt resting upon his lower jaw and the point against his palate. The blood then began to pour out in such streams that it formed a great river called Vaughn. The wolf was destined to remain thus chained fast until the last day when he would burst his bonds and would be free to avenge his wrongs. The wolf Fenrir, freed from the chain, shall range the earth. Death Song of Hakon While some mythologists see in this myth an emblem of crime restrained and made innocuous by the power of the law, others see the underground fire, which kept within bounds can injure no one, but which unfettered fills the world with destruction and woe. Just as Odin's second eye is said to rest in Mimir's well, so Tyr's second hand sword is found in Fenris's jaws. He has no more use for two weapons than the sky for two suns. The worship of Tyr is commemorated in sundry places, which bear more or less modified forms of his name. The name has also been given to the Aconite, a plant known in northern countries as Tears Helm. <laughs>